morning celebration church. If you're in the foyer, grab something good to eat and get in here. We're going to worship. If you're able this morning, I would invite you to rise to your feet and lift your voices to your Savior. Christ is my reward and all my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will see no turning back. I've been set free. Christ. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Christ, my all in all. Join my salvation. And this hope will never fail. Heaven is our hope. My soul will sing, Jesus is here, to God be the glory, Christ is enough for me, Christ is enough for me, everything I need Everything I need, Christ is enough. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back the cross before me the world behind me no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. Sing, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, oh, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided. Follow Jesus, no turning back, 
No turning back I have decided Follow Jesus Turning back No turning back Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Let's sing that again My hope is built on nothing less in Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name In Christ alone, cornerstone Weak made strong in the Savior's love Through the storm He is Lord, Lord of all When darkness seems to hide His face I rest on His unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil In Christ alone, cornerstone Weak made strong in the Savior's love Through the storm He is Lord, Lord of all He is Lord, Lord of all When He shall with trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the His wounds, His 
hands and feet my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. Endless days we will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. And on the third, the break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trampled death. Where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ my King. Come on, church, lift your voices. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days I will sing. sing that again. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. He shall return robes of white blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh, oh, oh praise the name of the Lord
my soul undeserving. Sing, God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so to age and hour by hour the dead are raised this sinner saved by the work of your power sing God you're so good God you're so good God You're so good You're so good To me Sing it again now God You're so good Yes you are God You're so good God I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory, Jesus' name. And should this life bring suffering Lord I will remember what Calvary has bought for me both now and forever sing God you're so good come on church God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Just proclaim it this morning. God, you're so good. Yes, you are, Lord. God, you're so good. God, you're so good, you're so good to me. Sing it again now, sing God, you're so good, God, you're so
for the glory of Jesus' name. Come on, declare it, church. I am blessed. I am called. I am healed. I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. time lift your voices God you're so good come on church God you're so good yes you are God you're so good you're so Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord, and um, I just want to pray a special blessing as we go into this fall season, Lord, on everyone here. I know that um, this season with the holidays and the dreary weather can be a little bit challenging for people, and I pray that um, everything I would announce and this body would be an encouragement um, and a source of strength for people to get out and stay connected and um, just feel your presence and um, feel you moving in our community. Thank you for being here with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Ashley and everyone online. Um, I have some announcements this morning, and they're kind of interactive because you all look very awake and um, ready for some Sunday fun. So the first thing I'm going to have you do, if you need a little stretch, is to reach forward and grab the Connect card in the seat pocket in front of you. Um, if it's your first time here, your second time here, or your thousandth time here, you can fill that out. Um, it's a way to connect with us, to learn more about what we have going on. Um, if you want to make Stephanie smile during the week, um, or you have a prayer request, just fill it out and drop it in the tithe box on the back wall over there. Um, and the next thing I'm going to have you do is pull out your phone. So don't act like you didn't bring your phone to church. You know you have your cell phone with you. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with QR codes, but I'm going to teach you how to use it um, for those of you who don't know how to. Um, so open your phone and then open the camera app. Don't take a picture, but just point the camera at that QR code box up there. And you might have to zoom in, use your fingers, spread it out a little bit. Um, and a little yellow link should pop up. If you click on that, it should open the sign up for our trunk or treat. Any success? Oh, and for the online people, the QR code is floating above my head. And it'll work the same way, so hold your phone up to the screen. So we need people to decorate their trunks. Um, and we also need people to help out with games, I think, in the field for some of the older kids. Um, it's going to be Saturday, October 29th, 4 to 6 p.m. Um, this was a blast the last two years. And even if you're not super into Halloween and all the creepy stuff, um, we had like really fun trunks like pirates and Star Wars and Pokemon and um, I think we had a petting zoo one year and bed bugs in a truck bed. Um, so go ahead and sign up for that now if you're able to decorate a trunk or help with activities. Um, it's going to be a really good time. We also have the Thanks Gathering service coming up. That's on Thanksgiving morning um, from 9 to 9.45, so it's um, a short service. But this was such a blessing to me last year, um, being able to just wake up, start my day with praise and thanksgiving to God, still have plenty of time the rest of the day to cook for dinner. Um, but the highlight is hearing from other people that get to read letters. And there's a few that stuck with me from last year, um, from some people that I got to know that I didn't know that well before, some people that are quieter, um, and getting to hear them open up from the heart is really a beautiful thing. There's someone um, close to me this year that gets to read a letter, and I'm excited about getting to hear those. So I hope you'll join us with, um, for that. Now for Zyger, um, I have a little coloring book here because this is also going to be interactive. I have all these coloring books. They look like this, and they're in the south foyer on the table. Um, last week or last month, we talked about praying for the Zyger families. Keep doing that. Keep donating. But also, um, I want you to be able to kind of participate and do something fun with them and encourage them. So if you can grab a coloring book, bring it home, and then you're going to color just the first page. We want to keep the rest of the pages for the kids because we're going to give these to them with some crayons. 
Um, so color the first page and then write an encouraging note. So this one says, hope you have a great day. Someone's thinking about you. Sign your first name. If you bring these back by Sunday, November 6th, then we will put them in the bags that week and they will get to be passed out to the kids. So this is going to be a tangible way um, where they get to know that someone cares about them, is thinking about them, um, along with their fun food and snacks that they get for that week. So um, grab one on your way out. Please um, do that. And last, but definitely not least, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So we love Pastor Dustin and Stephanie and their family. And um, if you have time or you feel led, send them a note of encouragement. Pastor Dustin said words of affirmation are his love language. So um, start talking encouragement to him. Um, and then we're doing a special offering next week for them. So if you're able to donate for that, um, this is just a little thank you um, to bless their family for all the hours of hard work. Um, you know, there's no set hours as a pastor. It's probably 24-7. So, and for the pastor's wife. So um, please join us in celebrating them this month. Before I get started, I talked last week about a wonderful cup that my daughter had made that was Darth Vader, and I remembered to bring it today. So you know, last week we talked about you know, God being the potter, us being the clay, and as the clay, we don't get to tell the potter what we do and don't do. He molds us for his purpose, and we said sometimes people may say, well, you're not supposed to do that, or that's ugly, or whatever, and I said, you know, this was the purpose of Avery's Darth Vader cup. And it's funny, she looks at it now, and she goes, I should have just made it black. And I, 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 I don't tell her no, but, uh, but I tell her, you know what, Avery, this is awesome. And she drinks out of this. I made the mistake of uh, not realizing how much this holds, and I filled it with milk one day. And then we had to go get milk later that afternoon, because it holds quite a bit. And she didn't drink any of it. But, but I thought I'd share that with you guys since I talked about it. Avery's camouflage, gangrenous Darth Vader cup. So good to see you guys this morning. Um, if you're, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12. Um, we're gonna uh, put a kind of a not a period, but a comma on our Roman series and kind of finish it up today um, as we dive into the holidays. And if if you were with us at this point last year, um, or if you join us online regularly and you were with us last year, you'll, you'll learn um, that, or you learned, or you will learn if you haven't been with us, that we love the holiday season in our household. When it comes into Thanksgiving, and specifically Christmas, um, it looks like a Christmas monster barfs in our house. Like, we, we go crazy. At, at our house in California, we had one Christmas tree. It was a pretty small area, and the, the house we have here is, is a little bit bigger, and so I think now my wife has four trees that will be up in our house. And you know that, that's just an example of the Christmas in, in our house. And just yesterday, she goes, it's getting cold. Mariah Carey is going to start hitting our, our car radios real soon, right? Christmas time is coming. But we love the holiday season. We, lo we love the joy. We love the family, the community, just all the things that come with the holiday season. And um, as Ashley said, you know, it, this, this is no secret to people that, that know me from this time last year. Thanksgiving is my absolute favorite service of the year. I love this service more than our Christmas service, even more than our Easter service. Thanksgiving for me, it's just something that has always hit very, very special to my, near and dear to my heart. Coming here and um, hearing people read letters that they wrote to God about what they're thankful for is really, really special. So I, I hope that you guys can join us. I mean, it's, it's a shorter service on Thanksgiving morning, just 9 to 9.45. And um, I, I absolutely love it. I, I'm in tears every year when people are just expressing what God has done in their lives, and it's very, very special. But um, part, something that comes with our Thanksgiving service is there's, um, there's an offering that we received for the very first time last year in November, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. And this was our harvest offering. So uh, we had done this. It was the first time I believe we'd done it here. It was the first time since I've been here because last year was my first year. But we received this offering last year, and what the harvest offering is, the harvest offering was an offering we received where not one single penny of it stays in-house. Every dime of it goes out to different missions projects. We've been able to bless missionaries with it. We've been able to do uh, bless schools. We've been able to help people that have, that have literally come knocking on our door and said, this is broken in my house, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. We've been able to provide them with assistance and help. So this money goes out as a part of our mission to reach the world for Jesus. And last year, I remember when, when we talked about the harvest offering, um, we, we talked about how this is a sacrificial gift. This is something where I said, what, what I don't want this offering to do, I don't want this offering to replace your regular tithe. I don't want this to be a replacement saying, well, I won't give to the church this time this month because we'll give to harvest instead. This is something that we go above and beyond for. This is something where we say, hey, this month I'm going to give up this. 
I'm going to say, I don't need to do that, and I'm going to give it to this, because this gift is going to go out into the world to reach the kingdom of God, specifically to go out. Um, and, and I know that I actually just said next week there a, a pastor's appreciation offering. It's really weird for me to talk about it, honestly. But, but I would say this even. A way that you can show me appreciation is by giving to the harvest offering. The, I, I know that last year, I believe, we raised just over $20,000 in this one offering. And I was floored. When I got the phone call from our accountant who said, um, I, I said she said, hey, do you want to know the total? I said, yeah. And she said, are you sitting down? I said, I am now. And she told me what the total was, and I'm glad she told me to sit down because I about hit the floor. And with that money, we've been able to help one of our missionaries who was in a, a, serious, a serious car accident. We were able to help with his medical bills. Um, another missionary had two kid, has two kids, and they were hit with unexpected medical expenses. And then on top of that, their one source of transportation and in their mission field broke down, and they said, we need X amount of dollars to fix our car. Otherwise, we have to stop. We were able to say, hey, we can cover your car. We can get things going so they didn't miss a beat with their kids' medical expenses, with their vehicle. It was so cool to be able to say, hey, we as a church get to go out to the world and support people. And I know that not everybody can go on trips. Not everybody can go to the world and do all these things that we support, but everybody can be a part of it. Everybody gets to be a part. And so the Sunday after Thanksgiving, we're going to have a time here in service where we'll receive our thanks gathering and our harvest offering. And so I want you guys to do something as we get up into that. Uh, pray with me for the harvest offering. Pray, pray, ask God, what is something that, that we can all bring to the table and say, you know what, God, I'm going to put this aside. I'm going to give this to you, and I'm going to give it to your people and know that it's going to go do something bigger than I could do on my own. Um, we, we know that it's a sacrificial thing, like I said. In 2 Samuel 24, 24, uh, David says this. He says, I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord my God that have cost me nothing. So we see David saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to give something to God. It's going to cost me something. But that cost is nothing compared to what God gets to go do with it. And we all get to be a part of that today. So how do people like us impact a needy world with, the, with this offering that we receive? There's a number of things that we get to do and ways that, that our lives affect this. I know that when we want to impact the world, we live a life based on God's word to hear God's plan for the world. We get to work our best to live an established life in God's will, focusing on his plan, purposes a bigger and above our own. Live a life filled with faith, praying and believing God to do that what he can do are things that we cannot do. And we get to live unselfishly committed to God's work, no matter the cost. Pray for those things. Pray to God. He hears you. Not all can go, but everyone can pray. If you hear God's voice talking to you in this time, give to it. Not all can go, but we can all give. And if you sense God's call, go. Go and do something. We'll be talking about our Mexico missions trip again starting up this next year. And if you feel God's sense to call, go on the trip. Be a part of what we get to do beyond our walls. It's going to be amazing. So I invite you now. Pray for it. The Sunday after Thanksgiving, it's going to be an awesome time where we get to see what God gets to do with our resources. Amen? Let's pray as we get ready for this morning. God, thank you so much for today. I thank you that you are so much bigger than us, but I thank you that through us, we get to, through you, we get to do amazing things. So God, as we, as we dive into uh, the, the end of Romans and this Thanksgiving season, God, I pray that we always remember to stay focused on you, focused on what, what you give to us and how we can sacrifice ourselves, more of us, for your glory. So God, I ask that you use us in incredible ways, bigger than we can imagine, and that the world is impacted in amazing ways as well. We thank you, we love you, and everybody said, amen. amen. All right, well, like I said, we're going to uh, finish up on Romans today, and um, I, I really like going through the book of Romans, and we, we've gone over a bunch of different key things that Romans has, has talked about, but as we, as we end our series on Romans uh, for now, I want to go over one of the big key principles I think Paul really hammers in and buttons up this book with, but before we dive into that, I do want to play a game with you all, and I'm a youth pastor, children's pastor for years, this, this happens from time to time, but I want to play a game with you, and this is called Sink or Float. How many of you guys have ever wondered if things will sink or if things will float, right? Kind of a, kind of a silly thing, but um, I actually was inspired by this at um, one of the farmer's birthday parties when I tried to throw one of the kids in the water, and they pulled me in the water with them, and I did not, you know, float very well. I sank right there. But objects, will it sink or will it float? So the first object, we have a Lego piece. If you were to toss a Lego piece into the water, all right, how many of you guys, just raise your hands, how many of you guys say this thing is sinking to the bottom? Yeah. All right, how many of you guys say this thing floats? 
All right, we've all stepped on Lego pieces before, right? Yeah, that's, that's worse than stepping on a nail. But a Lego piece will float. A Lego piece will float in water. Second thing, this one, maybe, I think we should all get this one, a rubber ball. How many of you guys think this will sink? Say, Odin, I knew you'd raise your hand. I knew it. <laughs> Not even a doubt. All right, how many guys, this is going to float? Yep, all right. A rubber ball, yes, of course, this will float. All right, a little trickier one, a Jolly Rancher. No, a Jolly Rancher. Will the Jolly Rancher sink or will it float? All right, see those hands. How many say this is sinking? How many of you guys think this will float? All right, a Jolly Rancher will sink. Jolly Rancher will sink. All right, a whole lemon. A whole lemon, sink or float? All right, how many of you guys think a whole lemon will sink? How many think it will float? A whole lemon will float. A peeled lemon will sink. But a whole lemon in that form right there, it will float. All right, a can of Coca-Cola. A can of Coke. How many of you guys say this will sink? How many say this will float? Now, for those of you raising your hand saying it will float, do you prefer diet sodas? <laughs> diet sodas will float. A regular can of Coke will sink. Now, the sugar content in a regular can of soda will make it sink, but the diet sodas, those will all float. They make you feel lighter as you consume them too, right? Yeah. All right. Kind of a tricky one. Paperclip. A paperclip. Will a paperclip sink or float? All right. Let's see the hands for sink. Let's see the hands for float. All right. This one's kind of a trick, honestly. A paperclip dropped in water will sink. If you so lightly lay that thing on its side on the top of the water, it will float. But the minute it's disturbed, it's going down. So for... For example's sake, it sinks. And then the last one, a pencil. Will a pencil sink or, a fl or will it float? How many of you guys think that will sink? How many say it will float? Theoden, you, gosh, you dude. <laughs> a pencil will float. Now, um, what's funny is there's, there's a whole YouTube channel dedicated to will it sink or will it float. And there's actually, in a big enough body of water, I think up to a nine-pound bowling ball will actually float. But then once you get to 10, that thing sinks. But, um, but it's kind of fun, and I know some of you, you can go home and experiment with, with kids or family or what things can you get to float. And it's kind of fun seeing what will sink, what will float. But it's clear that something's going to do one of two things when you throw it into a body of water. It will sink or it will float. Sometimes you'll get something that will stagger for a minute, like if you get a cup and you throw that in, you're like, oh, that thing's floating. But as soon as water goes into the opening of the cup, then that thing goes down, and it's going to sink. It's going to do one of two things. Objects that even float by accident eventually can sink. Now, a lot of you raise your hands for something sinking. A lot of you, you know, for something's floating. Some of you were tricked. Theoden picked the wrong answer on purpose every time. But, um, but, it, but in typical fashion, this was not just a game. There's, there's, there's a point to this, sinking or floating, right? We've learned a lot in our Romans series this past couple months. We've, taught, we've asked ourselves a lot of questions about how do we apply this? What, what, is the, what are the messages Paul is really conveying through this book? And the things that we, we've touched on, we've talked about the problem of sin, We've talked about his rescue from sin. We've talked about the pursuit of righteousness. And the last week we talked about how God chooses us. He has chosen each and every one of us for an amazing purpose. Taking all this into our minds, these four big lessons so far, we have an option now. When we take these and go out into the world and into the troubles that we face, the question for us today is when we go out, are we going to sink or are we going to float? What's going to happen when we get flooded with problems and flooded with trials? Are we going to be something that so lightly will stay atop unless, unless, if nothing touches us, but then we go down? Or are we going to be able to be one of those things like, like a rubber ball where no matter what happens, you push that thing down, it just fires out of the water? Are we going to sink or are we going to float? And I think this is an important question because as we learn about sin and redemption and, and righteousness, we're often asking ourselves this question with God. We say, okay, God, now what? Now what do I do? I, I, I've learned these things. I'm, I'm reading, I'm applying, but when I go out and something happens, now what? How do I float in this situation and not sink when the world comes at me? Romans chapter 12, we're going to read what Paul says about this and something we can do in our lives to make sure we float through these issues. We float above these problems and don't let them consume us. Starting in verse 1, he says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now, one of, one of the, the first couple of lines in this passage here is, is the big line, right? It says, Paul mentions this concept of a living sacrifice. Now, in the Old Testament, there, there's lots of sacrifices. There were sacrifices for different occasions. There were lots of different kinds of sacrifices, certain animals for certain things. It was a, a whole plethora of ways you could sacrifice. And then Paul ups the ante here post-Jesus. He says, now offer yourself as a living sacrifice. He changes it. He calls us to that. He says, you as believers, you are now to be a living sacrifice. And th this type of, of sacrificial living is, is different because what it does is it, it uh, takes us from this place of saying this is all about me to a place now where you are crawling to the altar and not crawling away from the altar. You're humbly presenting yourself to God. You are this living sacrifice, which can be a confusing term, which we'll talk about today. Luke 9.23 says this, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Take up their cross daily and follow me. Now, this isn't always going to be comfortable. I can't imagine when Jesus was carrying his cross that that was a very comfortable thing to do. And although we may not be carrying a physical cross, taking up your cross, taking up your burdens, putting some things aside and following Jesus can be a painful thing. It can be an uncomfortable thing, something that leads us into potential suffering. But ultimately, this is what God desires. So, so how do we do this effectively? How do we recognize it, and then how do we put this into practice? And I believe uh, Paul lays out a guide for us in this passage, this, this passage in Romans here on what we're supposed to do. The, the importance of saying no to the things of the world, the things that require us crawling to the altar instead of, of leaping out for ourselves, living sacrificially instead of saying yes to the world, saying yes to God. And ultimately, we get to understand what this means. And that's our first thing that I think Paul's telling us to do. Paul's telling us in this package, we have to learn how to say no to the world. We have to learn how to say no to the world. Um, are there any yes people in here? Like when, when, when someone asks you something, you're a yes person. That, that, that's what you do. That, that's just who you are naturally. I, I'm a yes man. I don't like saying no. As a matter of fact, I have so many times quadruple booked myself because I don't say no. And, and I, I, I say yes, I, I want to say yes, I have a hard time saying no, it's really, really hard for me, but the first thing Paul is telling us, is, is inviting us to do is, sometimes we have to learn to say no. And I, I'm a firm believer that in everybody's life, everyone has a rhythm to their life. Everyone's got this, this, this routine, right? So, so for some people, you wake up, you drink your coffee, which is disgusting, I don't get it, but, but you, you drink your coffee, hot chocolate for the win every, every time. But you drink your coffee, maybe you'll have your Bible study, and then you get on with your day. Or maybe you have a workout routine, like that's how you start your day. But people have a rhythm, right? Maybe your rhythm is the alarm goes off, I hit snooze. Alarm goes off, snooze, 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 snooze. That's, that's your rhythm. It's muscle memory now, right? Just hitting that thing. And then you get up with your day when you realize I've got to be to work in 15 minutes. Time to go. But we, we all have rhythms. And there are healthy rhythms and there are unhealthy rhythms. And obviously those are, those are goofy examples. But, but each of us, even when it comes to our walk with God, I believe each of us has a rhythm that we can either step into or be totally out of sync with. And a lot of that has to do with what are we saying yes to? What are we saying no to? Are we living our life in a healthy rhythm? And oftentimes we can find ourselves caught up in a very unhealthy rhythm. I remember for me one, uh, one time period in my life, it was a summer in particular, um, my, my rhythm got very unhealthy, but I justified why I was doing it. Um, there was one summer in particular where I was working overdrive for I think six or seven straight weeks. I directed two summer camps. I led a Mexico missions trip. I preached at the church in Mexico. I preached five messages consecutively in church that week. I led four sports summer camps for kids. I was up late writing messages. I was up late planning things. I was working with teams. There was no sleep. And at the end of it, I felt really, really good. Guess who did not feel really, really good? My wife. My family did not feel really, really good. I was feeling like I'm doing this, and, and I was justifying it by saying, you know what? This is all for church. This is all for church. This is all for ministry. And, by, and at that point, I was working at another church, and I was the children's and youth pastor. 
And for me, when I was asked, you know, hey, do you want to take over the summer for the church and, and, do the, and speak five messages over the course of the summer, I was like, yes. I went home and told my wife, like, I'm going to preach. I get five consecutive weeks to preach. And she said, are you crazy? And I said, why? She goes, you're directing youth camp. You're directing kids camp. You've got in the middle of those weeks, you've got four sports camps that you're doing for the kids in the community. You're leading the Mexico trip. You're preaching at the church while you're on the Mexico trip. And you just added speaking five times to your calendar. Your calendar was already insane. And I said, I've got this. It's ministry. This is my job. So I'm supposed to do. What I could have said when I was asked to do some of these things, I could have said no. And that would have made my wife much happier. No, I wouldn't have been able to do everything that I felt I was doing good. But at the same time, when I look back at that, as much as I was feeling like I was doing really, really good, that was not a rhythm that was sustainable for my life. It was not a healthy rhythm. And what I needed to do is I should have learned to say no to a couple of those things to make sure that I still had time, obviously my time for my walk with God, time to do my job and do it well, but more importantly, time to make sure my wife and my family was priority in my life as well. And because I didn't say no, I was using ministry to justify it. I was using ministry as, and my, my need for approval, right? At, at the end of everything that I did that, that summer, um, it was, as Ashley said, my love language is words of affirmation. That's totally true. So just, just feed it whenever you want. But, but my need for that affirmation was fueling my desire to say yes and do these things really, really well. Dustin, will you do this? Yes. Will you do this? Yes. Because at the end of it, what did I hear? Doing good, great job. One, one person actually came up to me and they gave me what I call a backhanded compliment. Um, he was like, hey, good job. Um, what I mean is, when I finished this series that I preached at the church, a, a woman came up to me and she said, Pastor Dustin, I want to talk to you about the series you just did. And I was like, awesome, let me hear about it. She goes, normally when you preach, I'm disengaged, I don't pay attention much, I, uh, I don't really feel like it relates to me. And I was like, huh? Okay, and then she goes, but this series you just did was awesome, and I loved it, and I felt so, I felt so motivated and connected with God. And I was like, you couldn't have led with that, just, <laughs> all right. But I, was, I wanted the affirmation, but it led to an unhealthy rhythm in my life. Sometimes I was saying yes to worldly affirmation, but what Paul is telling us in this passage is we have to learn to say no. We have to learn to say no to the world. In this season, I allowed the, the, what my worldly aspirations to, to help me, to make me lose focus. I was in this rhythmic cycle that I was so embedded in, I couldn't even see getting out of it until it finished. But I know that God wanted me to say no to a couple things, and I should have said no to a couple things. For, for us in our lives right now, maybe the step towards transformation, the step towards renewing our minds and being this living sacrifice is looking at maybe a sinful habit that we know we have right now and saying, I've got to start saying no. There's something in my life right now that I just have to start saying no to. Maybe it's something that's really, really easy. You may think right now, that's an easy thing to say no to. For some people, it's such a part of your rhythm, it's going to be really hard to switch from, really hard to say no. <clears throat> Sometimes we could say, you know, we can see that sin has been creeping back into our life, and every time we convince ourselves it's gone, we jump back in. Sometimes we just got to look. I mean, I'll tell you right now, if there's something unhealthy in your life, there's a sin in your life, the answer is always no. The answer is always no. If you remember going back um, a few weeks ago when we talked about the big problem with sin, we talked about Genesis 4-7, and a refresher for it, it says this, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Sin wants you. Sin wants you, but we can say no. How many of us right now can say that? We have an unhealthy rhythm in our life. Because maybe as, as we're doing is what Paul has says, right? Paul said we're, we're beginning to behave in the customs of the world. When we have a rhythm in our life that will be in some form or fashion, it, it mirrors something in our life. So either we mirror the world and its values or we mirror God and his values. We, we can't do both. We, we've got to pick one that we say, I want this to be my influencer, and then that will help us learn what we say yes to, what we say no to. But if we're saying no, what do we replace it with? We don't just want to turn into the no person, right? It's like, you know, I was a yes person. Now I tell no to everybody and everything. You don't, you don't, want, to, you don't want to go that crazy, right? So what do you say yes to? Well, I think Paul makes it clear in the scripture, if we say no to the world, then we're saying yes to the way. If we say no to the world, 
We're saying yes to the way. Once we're able to identify the, those worldly patterns, we identify those rhythms, we identify those things that we say, this is what keeps creeping back in. Once we're able to say no to that, we can then say, if I'm saying no, this is then what I get to say yes to. Every no that you say no to, you're, oppor- you're opening yourself for an opportunity for God to say, now I can say yes to this instead. Every no can lead to a very awesome yes moment for you and God. <clears throat> Jesus modeled this, this life of humble sacrifice in pursuit of restoration and redemption for mankind with the way that he said yes to his father consistently. In our Romans 12, 2 uh, verse, Paul seems to be concerned. He, he, he drives into this. If we're going to say no and yes, it, it drives in. It starts with how you think. It starts with how you think. Before you say, I mean, yes or no to something, it all starts with the thought. Our thought process is important when it comes to, to our growth and potential with the kingdom of God. Often temptation to fall into worldly patterns, the very first time you do something or you're thinking about doing something, that's the key phrase. You're thinking about it. You, you start thinking, do I do this? Is, is this the direction that I should go? It all starts with your thoughts. The same is true for the patterns that Christ wants in our lives. It's got to start with our thoughts. Spending time reading, spending time studying God's word, this is going to start giving us the right type of thought process. It's going to start, the, the, the more you infuse the word into your head, the more it's going to transfer into your heart, out through your mouths and your actions. But it starts with fueling your thoughts. And it's not something you can turn to every now and then. You know, t- turn to the word, turn to prayer, when things start getting bad. But something that when you start inf- infusing it in your life, in your everyday life, when those bad times hit, it doesn't turn into a, oh, Hail Mary prayer to God right now. Now i got to figure this out. God, help me. I don't know what to do about this. But, but the more you infuse yourself on a regular basis, those things hit, and you already know what you should do. You can already hear God speaking into your life before it turns into an issue bigger than you think you can handle because you're already filling your thoughts with his thoughts. The Bible talks about this. In Psalms 1, verse 2, it says this. Blessed is the person whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. I like that. And who meditates on his law day and night. King David is a walking, talking example of the importance of meditating in God's word. And I know that he still messed up, but he did a lot of good things. And he gives us such incredible insight when, when he talks about what it means, the power of meditating and dwelling in the spirit of God. God desires to have us in the word. He desires to have the word near us, but more importantly, he wants us in the word. He wants the word infused into our lives, infused into our actions and the way we walk, having our minds and our hearts transformed by his word. The work of becoming a living sacrifice requires a commitment like this. It requires us saying, if I'm gonna say no to things, I've gotta replace it with Jesus instead. Then we know how to make these decisions. Maybe there's something in your your morning routine that you need to change to allow God to start transforming you from the inside out. I know often when I talk with people about quiet time and and spending time in the word, there are some people that have actually said, you know, pastor, you've got it easy though. You can just come to your office, grab your hot chocolate, because they know I don't like coffee. Grab your hot chocolate, open your Bible, and just spend a couple hours reading scripture and just let that be your, let that be your Devo time. You know what I decided to do? I don't do my Devo time while I'm here at work. I like to do it before I come to work. I like to find a separate time to do it. That way I know that I'm not just making it a part of my work schedule because I know not everybody gets the, not everybody can do that. I like to do it before. And I also like to do it before I start my day. Read my Bible passage, do some Devo time, spend some time with God. I think of my life as like the instrument and I don't want to do my concert before I tune my instrument. It'll be a really bad concert. I want to make sure my life is right. So may, maybe for some of us, it means changing something in our morning habit. Maybe it's still not a morning thing for you. Maybe you do have your quiet time. It's just not in the mornings. That's fine. But maybe there's something in your routine of life where you say, this is what I can change to make my walk with God that much stronger. When we find that, when we find that worldly distraction, we're able to move it out of the way, we can allow God to come do an amazing transforming work. And Paul closes out Romans 12 too. With, by saying this, he says, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That once, once we let God transform our hearts, then we learn his will, and it's good, pleasing, and perfect. Once we do that, we'll start to understand what our purpose is. We're able to, have, we're able to discern our purpose. You know, even though Paul wrote this letter so many years ago, it's amazing that, that God knew what would be written then would still apply to today, right? He knew we would need these words. He knew what we would need to dwell on, what we need to let, we need to let infuse into our hearts to get us through these hard times. 
There are so many people today, I believe, even in this room or online or just out anywhere, that are tirelessly searching for their purpose in life. Filling it with the world, saying yes to the world and saying, this is what I think my purpose needs to be. But the thing is, when we start trying to have the world, when we turn into those yes people that say yes to everything, yes to the world, yes to the world, we start filling our lives with things of the world and we can, soon, we can pretty quickly figure out that it's not doing it. That's just not filling us up the way that we need it. And you start saying yes to other things instead. Yes to other things instead. And I, I do love the stories that people tell me when they say, I was looking for it in a relationship but it wasn't there. I was looking for it in social media. I was looking for status of approval here and I couldn't get it, but I love the stories when people say, but once I realized how to say yes to God instead, that hole was filled. Nothing of the world could fill it. Only saying yes to God can. Christ is the only one who could give you meaning and that purpose in your life. He called you to do great things for, the, for his kingdom. And I wonder how many of us have yet to maybe even sense that call because we've allowed those unhealthy rhythms to dictate our life. They've, we've allowed those things to keep us from fully saying, God, I am all in because there's still something we're holding on to. You can't be all in here and still holding on over here, right? The phrase all in means you're all in. Maybe we haven't been able to sense God because we haven't been spending that quality time with him, saying that he is in charge. The good news is this. There is time right here, right now, to rewire your commitments. There is no time too late. There's no time like the present to say, I'm going to do it right now and be all in. The Bible is full of circumstances where people who were doing one thing in that moment decided, I'm going to follow God now. And God did amazing things in their hearts. There's no time too late to rewire your life for God. The story that comes to mind when I, when I read this is actually the thief hanging on the cross next to Jesus. Luke 23, starting in 39, he says this. It says this. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This man is literally on his deathbed or death cross. This is the end for him. And in that moment, he decides, I need a priority switch. I, I recognize who is next to me, and I have messed up. I'm getting what I deserve. I want this man to know me. And in that moment, what does Jesus say? You're in. You're here. Jesus didn't say, well, you've got a lot to pay for, man. I know we're, we're both going to die here, and we're going to see each other after, and we've got we to we hash out everything and see if this is worth it. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, you're in. You're going to be with me. That moment mattered. If that story doesn't convince you that there is still time to believe, I'm not sure what will. <laughs> with God, every moment matters. Every single moment matters. John Maxwell, um, I love reading books by, by John Maxwell. He's an amazing leader. He was talking with a legendary basketball coach, John Wooden. And uh, as they were talking, John Wooden told him he could recognize times as he was coaching his players when players weren't giving 100%. And, and John, John Wooden being um, of some college years, he said that there would be college athletes that would come to him, and college is hard. You know, there's, there's lots of distractions, lots of distractions in college. But during practice, he would have players come to him, and he would know that during practice, they're not giving 100%. There's something going on in their life, and they are only giving me 80 today. So he would go to these players. And he told a story of how he went to one player. He said, hey, sat down, put his arm around his player, said, what's going on, man? What's, what's happening today? And the player shared with him what's going on. And, he, the, and the player said, I'm sorry, I can't give you 100 today. There's just too much going on. But tomorrow I will give you 120%. I will make up for this 120%. I'm all in tomorrow. And John Wooden just kind of sat with him and said, you know, you can't do that, right? You can't give me 120% tomorrow. That's impossible. You can only give me 100 I know, that, I know what the phrase means, but you can only give me 100%. So if you give me 80% today and 100% tomorrow, you know what happened? We lost 20%. You don't get to make up for that. You, you, you actually lost it. What you don't give me today, you've lost. But what you give up today, you've what you give me today, you've accomplished. <clears throat> so John said this. He said, never rely on tomorrow to bail you out because it can't and it won't. Make every day your masterpiece. This is why every moment matters. 
Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't, don't say, well, you know what? I'm kind of in now, but, but I'll, I'll go in tomorrow. Every moment matters with God. He's saying, grab it now. Do it now. Don't wait till later. Don't wait till a right circumstance happens. He says, Let, say yes to me today. Say no to the world now. Say yes to me now. Don't wait. Don't put it off. It's too important. Don't say, you know what? Tomorrow I'll, uh, tomorrow I'll decide to, to, to sign up to serve. T- tomorrow I'll decide that I'm going to give my sin up to God. I'll wait till tomorrow. I'm going to have one last hurrah, and then I'll give it up tomorrow. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't say tomorrow I'll dive into connecting someone with church. Don't say tomorrow I'll start giving to church. Don't say tomorrow I'll start reading and praying and I'll join a Bible study and a reading plan. Tomorrow I'll start my Devo time. Tomorrow I'll start taking my walk with Jesus more serious than I ever have in my life. God says don't wait till tomorrow. Don't give me 120% tomorrow. Give me 100% now. And give that 100% every single day. What we don't start today, we've lost it. But what we do today, we accomplish. Today matters. Every single moment of your life, every decision we make, every step we take with God, every step matters. God can use every moment of our life to in and out of our lives to to prove this point, right? But if you want to know Christ and you want to understand your call, we need to choose him now. Choose him now. And then, as Paul says, then you will learn to know God's will for you. And once you make that choice today, you know what you get to do tomorrow? Choose it again. And then the next day, choose it again. We get to take up our cross daily and follow God and see what his will is for us every day. Joel 2.12 says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Return to me with all your heart. I love that we can read stuff in the New Testament and keep going back in the Old Testament and seeing it echoed and repeated. And this can go all the way back to Genesis. Humankind messing up and then turning back to God. It happened with the very first two. They messed up, and they had to turn back to God. People in Genesis messed up, they had, and then they had to learn to forsake idols, turn away from sin, eliminate distractions, and simply return to a relationship with him. And we have Jesus. Christ came to earth, tempted by the same worldly things that we are tempted with, but he didn't sin. Ultimately, he was nailed to that cross so we could be transformed into walking, talking reflections of him. And today is a good a day, as good as day as any to say, you know what? Today is day one. Today is day one where I'm saying no to these things and I'm saying yes to God. So for us today, I de- do these things. Identify areas of sin and distraction in your life. Identify those things. Figure out what, what are they? What are the things that are holding you back? What are the things that you keep turning to? Once you identify those things, pursue righteousness, pursue redemption. Pursue reconciliation. God offers all those things free. He offers them. And then once you do that, offer yourself as that living sacrifice day in and day out. Choose to follow him. Choose to say no to the world. There is no one too far gone. There's no offering too small, no offering too large. Give him a minute. Give him an hour. Give him your life, and he'll use it to the fullest extent of your glory. I'd like to invite the worship team up as I read this passage. Romans 16, 25, Paul writes this as he concludes his letter. He says, Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all Gentiles might come to, ha- come to the obedience that comes from faith. To, on- to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. If you don't want to sink, if you don't want to sink, walk out this living sacrifice. Walk out this ability to say no to something. Say yes to him. Rise above the trials and troubles. Choose him every single day. I want you guys to, uh, would you all stand with me? Think about these things. Think about how far you've already come in your walk with Christ. I'm sure a lot of us can can pinpoint that, right? Look back at where we were and then see where we were. Think about that. Think of how far you've come, what Jesus has done with you. Know that your story is not over yet. Your story's not done. Your walk with Jesus, I don't care how young or how seasoned you are. Your walk with Jesus is still just beginning. He's got so many good things planned, so much more for us to do. 
God desires this transformational work to keep working in us continually. Feel something. Feel the sacrifice it requires to remain on that altar as a living sacrifice. Really feel it. What does it mean for me to give something up? What does it mean for me to say, God, this is me and I'm giving it to you. I'm giving this up. Feel what that is for you. And then do something. Begin to have your eyes open. See how God is seeking to use you. Walk this out. Make a decision today. Maybe you haven't signed up to, this isn't a shameless plug, but maybe you haven't signed up to serve at Trunk or Treat or something else. Let today be the day where you go online and shoot an email and say, I want to sign up. I want to do it. Maybe today is the day where you say, you know what? I, I, I attend church kind of. Maybe you join us online kind of. Maybe today is the day where you say, I'm going to do this regularly. I know this is important. I'm going to come. I'm going to be a part of it. Maybe today is the day where you say, you know what, God, I don't honor you very much with my finances. Today's the day where you say, God, I'm doing it. I'm trusting you with my finances. Today is the day where someone has wronged you in some way, shape, or form, and you want to reconcile with them. Let today be the day where you say, God, you forgave me. I'm going to forgive them, and I'm going to go talk to them, and I'm going to restore something. Let Jesus work in you and through you and out of you and start today. Amen? God, you are so good. I thank you for your love. I thank you that, that we get to sacrifice ourselves for you. And God, when we do, you don't leave us hanging high and dry. You are with us. You hold us. You carry us through it, God. And you desire to have us with you. So God, as we leave this place today, I pray that today is the first day of the best walk ever with you. God, that we leave here inspired, we leave here motivated and fueled by your love. And that love is shared with those we encounter. So God, we give you our hearts, we give you our sin, we give you the things that hold us back so we can say yes to you always. We thank you, we love you, and everybody said, amen. I cast my mind to Calvary, Jesus bled, he died for me, I see his wounds hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forever. bid you a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Get out there and show yourselves friendly and make a friend. Thank you so much. Have a great week.